All right, thank you. Um, we've been sitting down for a while already, so just before I start, can everybody stand up, turn around, introduce yourself to someone who you don't know, and find out why they're here today. Okay, so the metaphor of flow is one that many people have used to describe the sense of effortless action they feel in moments that stand out as some of the best of their lives. Artists and musicians refer to it as aesthetic rapture. Programmers as being dialed in, and athletes as being in the zone. Being in the zone is a state of mind, <coughs> achieved when we feel completely engaged in our performance, where the concept of the self slips below the threshold of our awareness, and our full attention is given to accomplishing something difficult and worthwhile. It's a feeling of complete immersion. I first remember being in the zone whilst playing representative basketball as a junior. I remember it vividly. It was the season final and we were underdogs. It was a time in life where everything went right. A type of euphoria. A strange calmness. I felt as if I could run all day without tiring. That I could dribble around any opponent. And I felt psychic as I could literally see three to four plays ahead. With 10 seconds to go in the game, we found ourselves down by two. The other team had the ball. They shot. My eyes followed the ball as it arced its way towards the basket. It bounced gently on the front of the rim, and then onto the backboard, trying its hardest to fall in. But it missed. I grabbed the rebound and raced down the court. I dribbled around one player, and then another. I drove my way to the basket. But before I could get my shot away, I was fouled. With 1.1 second left on the clock, I made my way to the free throw line. I looked around into the crowd, and I saw looks of anguish and trepidation on the faces of our supporters. But it didn't matter. For me, there was a complete absence of mental noise. It was liberating, soothing, exciting. I looked up at the basket, and it seemed bigger. <coughs> and I felt like I almost had a mystical connection to it. Time seemed to slow, like my mind was experiencing time dilation, a consequence of Einstein's special relativity. There was no self-analysis, no inner voice, no doubt, no worry. Just the moment. I was in the zone. I calmly nailed both free throws and sent the game into overtime, where we eventually won the game. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my first experience with a state of flow, and it was magical. Of course, the coach was very happy with our performance, and we celebrated late into the night, which led to a further state of flow. And then later, a further different state of flow. But in all seriousness, basketball was my game. It was something I pursued with passion, with vigour. I practised every day, at least six hours a day. I was intrinsically motivated to be the best that I could be. For me, the experience was the reward. When I wasn't at team practice, I was working on my individual skills. My dribbling, my through the legs, round the back, baseline drives, pull-up jump shots, fadeaways, baby hooks, rebounds, bank shots, fast breaks. Low post, high post, the kicking rock. Perhaps I had delusions of grandeur of becoming a professional NBA player. Some may have even said these delusions were unhealthy. But you know what? It was a beautiful thing. And that's the thing that people don't understand. As an outside observer, you're not going to understand if you don't invest the time. Looking at something for a few minutes and making judgment, you have the potential to mistake passion with obsession, 
and intrinsic motivation with addiction. You're just not going to understand the nuances. The lessons of play from the years and tens of thousands of hours I spent during my younger days involved in the game of basketball nearly always dealt with courage, adversity, and personal development, whilst teaching me the vital skills of self-discipline, persistence, patience, and resiliency. And although games in all their forms have been a universal part of human experience since the beginning of time, many would still look at a picture like this and say that this isn't rigorous and nothing of value could possibly be going on here. Many outside observers, parents and teachers, too easily differentiate between a time for play and a time for learning without seeing the vital connection between them. Play is for home, they would say. Play is for free time. Play is for children and only after the hard work has been done. Play is the work. The image of the geeky student who doesn't go outside and just plays video games is completely true. But it's also true for the student who spends six hours a day practicing basketball. And that kind of obsession in a young person isn't unhealthy. It's beautiful. That kind of obsession in a young person is going to lead to a sophisticated adult who understands the importance of self-discipline, persistence, patience, and resiliency, whilst being fully and truly invested in something. It seems so simple. And yet we are constantly responding to questions like, but aren't video games bad for you? What we as a society seem to suffer from is a form of historical amnesia. Each new panic develops as if it was the first time such issues have been debated in public, and yet the debates are exactly the same. Rock and roll, the telephone, comic books, Dungeons and Dragons, ballpoint pens, we're all going to be at the end of society at some point. Yet, yeah. There are literally thousands of ways games can be and are already being applied in learning contexts. Role playing, collaborative problem solving, and other forms of simulated experiences have broad applicability across a wide range of disciplines and are beginning to be seen in more and more classrooms. Take the group of students from Albany Senior High School in New Zealand <coughs> who created a full-blown mod of the AAA title Portal, which they called Portal Unity. This team of young students, led by a guy named Daniel, learned everything from Newtonian mechanics, such as mentally calculating the vectors of force and velocity, potential and kinetic energies, momentum, conservation laws, through to modern physics, such as Einstein, Rosen, Bridges from the theory of general relativity. Daniel and his team were involved in true inquiry as they first had to learn the authoring tools, think about character design and development, Narrative, scripting, <coughs> physics, flow, and story. They were part of an iterative design process where they had to shape and mould their product. And what about voice acting for their characters? Well, to create an artificially intelligent sounding voice, Daniel and his team had to learn about pitch, modulation, frequency, amplitude, and period. A hands down, better approach to the teaching and learning of sound and wave theory because it provides situated meaning to seemingly abstract concepts. Or simply, it just provides a context. Daniel describes how the cross-curricular nature of the project opened his eyes to the way that different disciplines can be combined into a career. During an interview, Daniel states that the more work we did, the more excited we got about the project, so we did more work, and then it got bigger. Isn't that great? Wouldn't it be great if all students felt that way about education? What Daniel is describing is a cycle of flow and passion. So Ken Robinson often talks about how finding your element or how finding your passion changes everything. And I agree. But this idea in a general sense of asking students to find their passion can be a pipe dream for some students and burdensome at best for others. Because sometimes you don't find your passion. It finds you. The grade five boy, Simon, who was in tears when we presented him with Junior Moderator of the Month and now leads our Victorian educational Minecraft community with skill and empathy well beyond his years. 
to the year nine boy, Jeremy, who creates amazing concept art that is soon to be used in a point and click adventure game. So the work I was doing recently with Nene in Beijing. Nene, a grade one teacher from the International School of Manila, sat in on a workshop I ran where we talked about game theory and game modding. During the workshop, we talked about trajectories of student participation whilst gaming. All students start as a noob, Students start gaining a certain level of mastery. Students start investigating optimal strategies, winning strategies, and counter strategies. And then they start asking, what if? We looked at a game called the Game of 31, a two-player card game of complete information, which is really a search for strategy to win. <coughs> there are secret numbers that control the game, counter strategies, and counters to the counter strategies. A week after the workshop, Nene emailed me with her story of how her grade one class, who call themselves the Brave Bats, had taken the game of 31 and were engaging in game modding, repurposing the rules, adding variations, and developing a love for asking the question, what if? Games teach children what some adults are now starting to realize, and that's some forms of learning are fast paced, Messy, non-linear, extremely compelling and rewarding. Games engender a spirit of playfulness. And the moment we invite kids to see the world in a playful way, it connects pleasurable emotions with learning. And to me, that's what the Back to Basics movement is all about. And this idea of connecting pleasurable emotions to learning was evident in some of the work I was doing with a student from Shepparton around Little Big Planet. Little Big Planet is a multiplayer game that puts the student in the role of designer and developer. It has an inbuilt level editor, which not only allows students to create and design their own levels, but also to publish and share with a vibrant community of Little Big Planet enthusiasts. The boy I was working with was having difficulties at school. So we gave him a design brief to design a particular level using Little Big Planet to teach his peers a particular concept in mathematics. He got to work and he spent a lot of time designing his own level. He was very proud of the work that he'd done and you could see his state of flow as he wanted to work through recess and through lunch. It got to Friday, he finished and we uploaded it to the PlayStation Network. Now this particular boy you would call disadvantaged. Welfare issues and definitely didn't have a PlayStation at home. So I shouldn't have been surprised come Monday morning when here he is waiting for me at the door. He wanted to find out how many times his level had been played over the weekend. So we go inside, we log onto the PlayStation network and we find that over the space of one weekend, this particular boy's level had been played, rated and reviewed over 50,000 times. Talk about giving students a global, authentic audience. The effect this had on this young boy brought tears to my eyes. He now knew that people out there valued the work that he did. Even if during traditional class time he was secretly embarrassed every time he got his grades back from his teacher. And this wouldn't have happened if he wasn't given the chance to express his learning in ways that was meaningful for him. What I have come to realise is that education is about helping students find their game. And to me, it's this idea that embodies games for change. Even though I didn't become a professional NBA player, my six hours a day of practice taught me persistence, patience and resiliency and enabled me to first achieve a state of flow. In education, we want our players to continue playing well after the win state. And if we can do this, if we can give them the freedom to explore what they're interested in, they will build the resilience, persistence and patience to achieve states of flow so that they see tough problems in life as puzzles and have the tenacity and motivation to solve them. Thanks.